Uh, I'd like to start with uh, uh, Tarkovsky's film, Nostalgia, which the Russian poet Gorgachev and his Italian interpreter engage in a geographical and spiritual journey across what Gorkachev memorably calls the sickeningly beautiful sights of central Italy. I have a second slide. Thanks. During a stay at a hotel, third slide, near Arezzo, they overhear Chinese music played on a stereo in another room by an unknown guest, a neighbor in an emery room. Upon responding to this sound and at the interpreter's prompting, Gorkachev makes a mockery of what he sees as a frivolous, delusional attempt to understand another culture by, for instance, showing an interest in Chinese music. Redolent of Spangler's pessimistic, anti-humanistic interpretation of world cultures, the old dictum that foreign cultures cannot be comprehended, only observed, Gorkachev's reaction is for us doubly significant, not only because he runs counter to the all too frequent eulogies of a free for all global culture, the perfunctory celebration of the, dialogue, of the dialogue allegedly taking place on a global scale across linguistic, cultural, and political barriers. Gorkachev, and by implication Tarkovsky's stance, is also significant because he singles out music as the best example of the difficulty of that trespassing and the impossibility of that dialogue. It is as if the immediate sensory appeal of music, and in this particular case, its, its perceived exoticism, made it even more palpably opaque. Like poetry, music is a language, yet far from a universal one. To the contrary, and again like poetry, of which it often serves as a vehicle, music is instantiated by a plethora of highly individual forms and mutually exclusive dialects. When eradicated, stripped of its intimate ties to the land out of which it emerges, and the people by whom and for whom it is conceived, a musical repertoire is demoted to the mere status of organized sound. Global access and distribution, the film seems to be suggesting then, come at a prohibitively high cost. When asked by his interpreter how to overcome this admittedly bleak state of affairs, how he could ever hope that his own poetry be read and comprehended, Gorkachev replies cryptically by abolishing frontiers. The parable comes here to a close, yet it falls just short of delivering the requisite amount of wisdom. For the abolishing of frontiers is not a condition prior, whether logically or chronologically, to the exchange and enjoyment of artifacts, or the study and understanding of practices not one's own. Acculturation is itself an agent in the creation of networks and currents that not only transcend or run parallel to, but subtend the creation of political entities and new political entities at that. Europe is a case in point. Its cultural identity now paraded as a perfect antidote to centuries of bloody political separation and infighting, the foundation upon which to build a new and newly integrated economic and political union. So think about culture as the condition for an economical and political union. Music and art historians, however, know that the phenomenal growth of many genres and formats and the attended exchange of skills and personnel that that growth entailed did not merely fill a space that was already there, as much as actively created, contribute to its creation. This was no doubt allowed, it is encouraged, also by the cosmopolitan vocation of many aristocratic courts. But to stress the point about language, it would have been unthinkable without the lingua franca of Latin and that complex set of shared practices known as the liturgy of the church. The ineradicable ambiguity of a lingua franca, the way in which a lingua franca both opens up new spaces and cordons off others, however, is very much with us today, even at a conference uh, like Draft, in fact. And if yesterday Ranjit heard uh, Raft, you know, heard the in the word uh, uh, resonances, you know, um, um, along to the effect of raft and rafting and, and, and displacement, I, I, I want to think about uh, another uh, change of letter uh, uh, in terms of craft with the sea. And I want to think a little bit more about, I would like perhaps the conference to think a little bit more about craft and uh, the years, it, uh, the, even decades, it takes to acquire a craft and uh, the way in which language is in fact a craft. Um, to my students in Hong Kong, where I teach music and film studies, the linguistic situation of what in my own courses passes as Europe, not to mention the West, 
seems hope hopelessly fragmentary. And this is true whether I teach the 13th, 17th, or 20th century, whether I teach Marchot, Monteverdi, or Janáček. Through them, reflected in their queries and their work, I once again see the specter of a babel of languages and cultures. Albeit obliquely, even instrumental music confront us with the impossibility of translation. The more one pushes linguistic differences aside, it seems, the more they come back to uh, haunt us. There are other challenges having to do with the fact that Hong Kong is one of the world's most active fault lines. And here I'm perhaps echoing what Cosmin was saying earlier. Politically, economically, and linguistically, though luckily not geologically, at least not so far. Um, like so much else in that uniquely situated city in Hong Kong, the teaching of music is best described as a work in progress, driven by competing and in some cases, frankly, incompatible agendas. The dizziness that comes from having to constantly define anew what we do and why, accompanied by a similarly dizzying sense of being on the cusp of epochal changes outside our immediate control, strike at the core of my unwitting role of bearer of the so-called European tradition. The moniker Western music uh, in Hong Kong refers to several things at once. Far from denoting simply a cultural sphere uh, or a taste, a particular taste, the adjective Western, refreshingly for me, has a con very concrete, immediately graspable, geographical uh, meaning. The West in Hong Kong is thousands of miles apart, and contact with it is hardly if ever direct, taking instead the form of exchange of capitals, technologies, and cultural forms, themselves highly mediated. The agents of such mediation, as I see it, correct me if I'm wrong, are the territory's former administrators, the British, local residents returning from Europe, Australia, and North America, as well as that great and still woefully unrecognized dispatcher of anything Western across East and Southeast Asia, namely Japan. The intensity of Hong Kong's engagement with cultural imports, European art music being one of them, gives one pause. Whether one calls it translation, recontextualization, appropriation, or as we will hear later, misreading, this process of engagement is taking place at a long enough distance from the radiating center of the tradition and under different enough circumstances to make one revisit the term tradition and everything else that that term, or so we have been taught, ought to imply. Unlike North America, where the European tradition has flourished via direct contact, uh, via direct contact exchange, if not wholesale migration of some of its key practitioners, Hong Kong relies less on the exchange of people, of people, the testimony of card-carrying members of the profession, than the ability of music to travel, as it were, light. All the more so in the digital age. Indeed, it is no exaggeration to claim that the transmission and distribution of European art music hangs on to, hangs on to the intangible yet extraordinarily resilient repertoire itself. The sonatas, symphonies, cantatas, and operas that make up the bulk of the canon in the West as well. The canon, this canon, is being taught at breakneck speed and with unbridled enthusiasm and transport by performers, composers, and musicologists, not only in Hong Kong, but throughout the Chinese-speaking world. So the People's Republic of China, in Taiwan, in Malaysia, in Singapore. The musical work, that discredited notion, declared moribund by the high priests of a new orthodoxy, is thus at the center of arguably the largest transplant of any classical tradition ever to be recorded. And yet, as a member of the sizable and still growing workforce channeling knowledge and repertories into a new context, I have become fully aware that the work is not a goal in and of itself, but rather a springboard for the creation of networks and a passage in an exchange of knowledge, skills, and capitals as well. Conservatories are sprouting throughout the region, creating jobs and careers, and feeding into an already booming fauna, a veritable bestiary of private instructors, tutors, mentors, and the names get more extravagant as the, as the, as the ambitions get loftier. Hong Kong, in other words, music is huge business, and not only in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, for its part, has not only been the breeding ground for a number of internationally respected pianists, composers, and sound artists, but is also home to what I like to think as a new form of Bita Maya, whereby home music making, especially at the piano, performs various functions. The management of a restless youth often prone to identity crisis, 
the acquisition of cultural capital for oneself or one's children, and a convenient retreat into the domestic sphere in times of political uncertainty. As part of this complex process of assimilation, appropriation, and capitalization, music history per se, uh, in other words, the uh, emergence of actual expertise, still sits at the margins of both the liberal arts and the conservatory curricula, respectively. Designing courses that emphasize the common practice repertory is littered with pitfalls and liable to generate misunderstanding too, especially among colleagues and critics or activists who view the repertory as little more than a trace of the fading British influence uh, on the territory. But it is also intoxicating in its potential for impact on both students and in its stress in teachers and researchers like myself. And let me explain why. Few of those who teach uh, in Hong Kong have personal roots where the classical music tradition originated or flourished. But rather than provoking sobering thoughts on the sorry prospects of ever inspiring composers, researchers, or performers truly at home with the repertoire, this state of affairs elicited soul searching on my part. Growing up in Italy at the time when the musealization of classical music was all but consummated, namely between the 1970s and the 1980s, one was bound to cast a disenchanted glance at the disappearance of the social and political structures whose needs underpinned the creation of the repertory in the first place. The radical separation, in other words, of music from the cultural projects that nurtured its emergence and transmission from the Middle Ages all the way to the 20th century. After World War II, Southern Europe is a different world, a world in which this music is as foreign, perhaps, as music coming from very different regions. Mary Schaeffer's notorious term, schizophonia, denoting the split of sound from its sources, does not begin to capture the radical process of reinvention, recontextualization, or as I prefer to call it, neutralization that has occurred in Italy, one of the geographical and spiritual hearts of the tradition. Musicology's quaint antiquarianism, its focus on the musical work and its aesthetic dimensions, decried as the symptom of a hopeless conservatism, seems to me now as the predictable, sensible even outcome of that state of affairs. Back in Hong Kong, on the other hand, the sight of thousands of young students practicing the piano, violin, or reading themselves to become opera singers, need not inspire apocalyptic tales of colonial oppression or post-colonial malaise. The active, deliberate appropriation of Western art music is, in fact, a fait accompli in Hong Kong, as well as Japan and South Korea. Music, moreover, remains the focus of a considerable administrative, financial, and infrastructural effort at all levels of education, primary through tertiary, unlike Southern Europe, again. To put this into context, we only need to remind ourselves of the legendary ambition and resourcefulness of an enterprising population, their access to and fluency with goods and knowledge from all over the world, and last but not least, the Hong Kong government's famed fiscal reserves to back it all up financially. To be sure, the openly utilitarian outlook of students and teachers alike may seem more like a betrayal than a fulfillment of an education in the arts, but in a strange and utterly compelling way, there is no question that what to me looked like a dead repertory has now insinuated itself into a new life cycle, fully integral to the personal projects of countless people across Hong Kong and beyond. In conclusion, in one of the earliest documented and self-conscious self expressions of cross-national cross -national appropriation, his Hamlet essay of 1796, Schlegel famously appropriated Shakespeare for German culture. It can boldly be claimed that, writes Schlegel, apart from the English, he does not belong as peculiarly to any other people as he does to the Germans. Nothing about Shakespeare is strange to us. We don't have to step out of our character a bit to call, it, to call him all our own." End of quote. To be sure, Schlegel's language may offend our sensibility of mobile cosmopolitan subjects, but we will do well to heed his acknowledgement of national borders if we want to table it and national identities, and uh, if we want to table a discussion with colleagues for whom national identity, national borders, as well as <coughs> um, uh, ethnic identity are the order of the day. As to Schlegel's claim that we can call Shakespeare our own, not only is it a truism, 
but in a new context, it takes on a decidedly equivocal color. Whether the form of appropriation it describes is possible, let alone desirable, across regions thousands of miles apart, is a question that we, in the so-called Western world, have been discussing at length, and given the legacy of colonialism, not without a hefty dose of guilt, or worse, self-serving zeal. It is a question, put another way, that as one part participant and two parts observer, I cannot even aspire to pose. Thank you.